Dr. Remert Ravenholt is a pioneering epidemiologist, going face-to-face -face with infectious diseases and tackling big tobacco. In this interview, Dr. Ravenholt highlights the biggest challenge of all, global population. My main work on uh, world population began in 1966. There were a lot fewer people then, so uh, should yeah, I say that you were, haven't been successful? There was just a, a little over three billion people in the world then, and now it's about 7.2 billion. We were successful in controlling population growth in Europe and in the Americas and much in Asia, but the Middle East and Africa have not been adequately taken care of. Everybody around the world wants the smartest people, such as yourself, to be working on the toughest problems. We have health care is a huge problem. The environment, again, a huge problem. Uh, water quality, a huge problem. Why pick population control? Well, I'm an epidemiologist, and population is always a question when you're dealing in epidemiology. How many deaths in a population? We were always concerned with populations. And thus, it was never far from my uh, interest and understanding. My, my professional life has been divided in three sections. The first was epidemic infectious diseases. But then I turned to chronic diseases, malignant cell evolution, cancer, and atherosclerosis. But then I was invited to take on, essentially, the, the ultimate job dealing with the world population explosion, because the population really was exploding around the world after wo World War II. So um, I was invited to take the role of uh, director of population unit at the U.S. Agency for International Development in 1965. When you went into USAID, did they have a policy that already existed? Not exactly. They they had uh, numbers of policy statements, but they did not have a clearly stated. That being, that being the case, did you help them create a policy? Oh, yes. Uh, we finally, uh, in 1967, we managed to, s to define the policy on one pa piece of paper uh, to the satisfaction of the uh, con Congress and the executive branch. So that by the beginning of 1968, we did have a quite clearly stated policy. 1968 was a, it was a very, very difficult time in the Vietnam War. There, of course, not to say that there was ever a good time in it, uh, but it was, there were a lot of casualties in, in 1968. Uh, there were many other things happening. I can't imagine that it was easy to do anything. You're quite correct. Uh, I remember back then, uh, President uh, Johnson uh, had a full understanding of the importance of the population determinant in the human affairs. It was very important, and he said so on 35 speeches. He spoke of the importance of that. Then somehow the uh, Vietnam War came along, and uh, I remember clearly July 1965, and on television I watched uh, President Johnson stand up and say, we will stand in Vietnam. We will stand firm in Vietnam. Push all the buttons to put a half million Americans into Vietnam to try and win that war. Well, of course, what happened then was that everything else sort of uh, were second rate, including his concern about the world population that <laughs> took took a rear seat then instead of the front seat. History has also shown us, though, that now that we're uh, at 7.2 billion people on the planet, that whatever efforts there have been on world population control don't seem to have worked. It has worked rather fully in Europe. It has certainly worked in North America and considerably in South America. And, uh, and it's also worked very well in much of the Asian continent most notably, of course, China, Japan, and South Korea, Thailand, and Indonesia all made great progress that, particularly China, really got the job done largely in the decade of the 1970s. They pushed really all the buttons that needed to be pushed 
to go from a great excess of fertility right down to where they wanted it, which would be about 10 or 12 births per thousand population per mm -hmm. year. China is, is known as an oppressive government, though. How did, is, did they do uh, their, have their population control as a, a result of oppression? Under the communist regime, they had starvation, and uh, probably 30 million Chinese died in those several years. They kind of started some birth control activities in the latter 1960s. They did not initially use oral contraceptives. From early on, they, uh, they used quite a lot of abortion and then uh, uh, intrauterine devices. General William Draper founded the Population Crisis Committee in 1959 and testified before Congress about world population issues. As soon as uh, he even mentioned population and the less developed countries, he got a uh, very uh, stern statement from the Catholics. The promotion of artificial birth control is a morally, humanly, psychologically, and politically disastrous approach to the population problem. They will not support any public assistance, either at home or abroad, to promote artificial birth prevention, abortion, or sterilization, whether through direct aid or by means of international organizations. So there the line was drawn. Uh, John Kennedy, of course, uh, was a presidential candidate there right then. He said that it would be a mean paternalism and not in the national interest for the United States to promote birth control overseas. And President Eisenhower, he said, quote, I cannot imagine anything more emphatically a subject that is not a proper political or governmental activity or function or responsibility. And an explosive question, they will go unquestionably to private groups, not to governments. You and can see it was, con from the beginning, it was a very controversial problem. When you were, were there at USAID, and, and later today, what is it with regard to population that you wanted? Wanted then and want now? I simply want to provide it possible for women and couples everywhere to control their fertility. And that was a bad thing? Well, it certainly was for the Catholics. <laughs> they did not want everyone to have the capacity to control their fertility. Now, um, you also, during this time period when you were at USAID, um, took many trips to many of the developing countries. Was family planning, was contraceptives, was the ability of families to determine their own uh, time of fertility, was that something that, that was the reason why you went, right? Right. In <clears throat> many countries, there was very little active family planning going on. Until 1960, two things happened. The uh, oral contraceptive, as we knew it, was licensed in the U.S. and shortly thereafter in Europe and uh, most countries of the world. Also, a, a new Lippi's Loop, an intrauterine uh, device, became popular. Dr. Ravenholt insisted upon wide distribution of condoms as part of the USAID program. I was going on a trip to Asia. The, the colored condoms were now fully available from a U.S. company in Alabama. And I took a, sub, a substantial supply along to Asia. And when I went to the various countries, if I showed colored condoms to the, to the ambassador or the head of the AID program, they were always immediately interested. Oh, gimme, you know. <laughs> they wanted some to show their wives and friends, I guess. You know, imagine that. I always thought that a gift to an ambassador would be a piece of art or something <laughs> like that, but you brought them condoms. Congratulations, we're, Yeah, Dr. well, they were very interested at that <laughs> point. Then we got earmarked funds from the Congress that year, $35 million. Then, then we could readily offer uh, oral contraceptives to any country that needed them. And, and then we did a number of things to improve this. Uh, initially, oral contraceptives were usually packaged in 
with uh, 21 hormone tablets. So a woman would take a tablet each day for 21 days and then stop for a week. We put in seven ferrous fumarate tablets, iron tablets, because in the much of Asia where the people do not eat a lot of meat, they tend to be quite anemic. Then a woman could just take a tablet a day, every day, and the seven days with her menses, she would be taking the iron tablets. And so this was a program of the United States federal government that you, right. were, you, you were administrating and, or administering, and right. we actually were, you were the one who was the architect of it. We were adapting the technology of oral contraceptives to what we needed to do over in all the developing countries. Mm -hmm. We want packaging, like three monthly cycles in a, another package. And then we bought these by the, the millions and billions. And we had some good people with AID office in Indonesia. Uh, we ha I had a problem early on there. Usually uh, out in the aid missions, when they're going to request materials for the next year from headquarters, they look to see how much they used last year. And so they look at past orders and past usage as a guide to how much to order for the next year. Well, of course, in certain situations that's appropriate, but when you're trying to, to mobilize a whole new program out there, that's a sure way to defeat yourself. The one person we had in Indonesia making putting in an order for, you know, a modest amount, just a few millions of, uh, or, of these packages, and we ordered 10 million cycles be sent over. And the next year we made it was ordered 20 million to be sent over. And the third year, 40 million to be sent mm. over. And they distributed those. Then they had a, an abundant supply. See, if the workers out there truly have an abundant supply and have confidence in it, then indeed they'll give away liberally. But otherwise, the pattern is in the less developed country, the AID mission and so forth, if there's a commodity that, that is valuable in itself, they tend to be hoarders in a sense. They, they give it out sparingly because they, they, they want to keep, the, the local worker needs to keep adequate ammunition in her, her own hands. So it was always a problem to caused them to start really giving away adequate quantities of contraceptives. Was there any uh, emotional opposition or, uh, you know, in some of the less developed countries that you've talked about, or any other type of opposition that wasn't of a science basis? Cultural opposition, perhaps? Yeah, that varied by country, of course. It depended upon leadership. Uh, Indonesia, we were fortunate that the uh, we had very good uh, people in the AID mission there, and the Indonesians had put some very good people in key positions. Uh, they got really caught up with the movement uh, from the president on down. They were all gung-ho to go. And the whole country, of course, with that kind of leadership, they all turned on to this. And they, so oral contraceptives went over big in Indonesia and Thailand and many countries. The adversaries of, of our programs they attack, and some of the congressmen like to get involved and then sort of make a bit flamboyant uh, statement. And Imagine that. <laughs> somehow, Senator Nelson from my home state of Wisconsin had hearings and invited anybody that had anything bad to say about oral contraceptives to say it to his committee, committee see, and deputy chief of, of uh, the uh, unit, the bureau that I was in. He read the papers and he said, we got to stop oral contraceptives. we got to stop it. You know, he, he checked out on it. And, and if I hadn't been an MD with impeccable training and experience and so forth, the, the program would certainly have vanished. But the I, sentiment was that strong in the early 1970s against it? Oh, yeah. 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 yeah it was, you know, you get one of these in the papers and zzz, zzz, But we, we persevered and we provided uh, oral contraceptives by lots of routes to the International Planned Parenthood Federation. 
So, Dr. Ravenhold, the oral contraceptives and all of the work that you did with them and spreading them around the world, uh, did it work? Oh, yes, it worked very well. And indeed, our program then became the main source of oral contraceptives for the less developed world. Mm -hmm. I was in my office in uh, Virginia, and a doctor from Johns Hopkins came to my office to show me uh, his equipment for doing tubal ligations. He, he said that this, this could be done as an outpatient procedure, and it simplified, and we, and we simplified the equipment uh, additionally so that it became very well designed to do this all around the world in fairly primitive situations. We discovered that there was intense demand for this by women of the less developed world. I remember particularly in Nepal, uh, there was a, a woman surgeon who was at Johns Hopkins for training and with some help from us, uh, she went back and she started her own tubal ligation practice. And as soon as this started, it was very popular. In Nepal, women would walk down from valleys, even walk for several days to get to where they could get this tubal ligation. That finally was a decisive solution to the problem of excess fertility for that woman. Now more than half the population of women in the U.S. will have tubal ligation after they finish the childbearing they want. And that became a very important part of our Well, there's program. this great picture that we, we have to talk about. And the, the woman in the, in the middle, in the, in the sari. Yeah, she's a gynecologic surgeon doing tubal ligations. In a good clinic, they could do from 15 to 30 tubal ligation patients in, a, day, in, an oper in a few hours. So it became tremendously efficient as a way of handling the problem. From a social point of view, it certainly was a large part of the solution to the problem. Dr. Ravenholt, we've talked about oral contraceptives. We've talked about condoms. We've talked about IUDs. Uh, IUDs. We've talked also about tubal ligations. Did abortion have a role in family planning? Oh, it always did. You know, from time immemorial, it had a role. Before these considerable numbers of contraceptives, abortion, of course, was practiced. Where they didn't do abortion, of course, in China, when in in periods of starvation, mm -hmm. they. Uh, they killed the, the infant. The, this was a common practice in, in China and many other countries. It was infanticide when they ran out of food. And they had to somehow uh, adapt surgical uh, abortion of the developing fetus. That became an important fertility control method in almost all countries. Now in Japan, for example, MacArthur and company agreed with the legalization of abortion in 1947. And so abortion became practiced greatly in Japan. It was condoms and abortion were the two main ways of controlling fertility. Japan was able to adapt to their straightened circumstances and really become very effective economically and everything. From the, from the USAID program, was uh, abortion one of the alternatives that you dealt with in family planning? It, it was, uh, particularly when, you know, with our Supreme Court decision, there was uh, every reason to add that to our armamentarium. But I was out in, in uh, India out beyond where electricity was available. Mm -hmm. We should make sure we have equipment that the people in the in these kinds of districts without electricity could could use. And so coming back from there, uh, we developed a project actually with Battelle Laboratories to produce a uh, 
a device that could be used without electricity. Was that something then that USAID was providing as well? Uh, yes, we, we got initially through the General Services Administration uh, in 1973. We initially bought uh, 1,000 of these units. Then, and then we fanned it out to testing in quite a few countries. And within two weeks, they all reported it worked very well. So in that one year, we went zoop, 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 to the end, and they indeed worked very well around the world, and they still do. But things, things changed. This very successful program that used all of these different methods of family planning, and including uh, the last one that we talked about, um, late 1970s, you made a decision to leave, and why was that? In December 1973, certain congressmen went ahead and passed a, a law that the U.S. could not provide assistance for abortion. And so that cut us off at the pass. That was a serious constraint upon the effectiveness of the program. Jimmy Carter became a candidate for the U.S. presidency. On the 31st of August, 1976, as he was campaigning, he and Ham Jordan and Stu Eisenstadt on his staff, they had lunch with the uh, the, the boards of the CIO and the AFL. And then the evening, they met for dinner with 15 Catholic bishops. And either that night or immediately after that meeting, a, an agreement was struck between Jimmy Carter and the Catholic bishops that if he were elected, he would turn over the direction of the agencies in the U.S. government would, uh, who were, had an interest in birth control, they would uh, put them under Catholic direction. Elections and political trade-offs brought big changes in the United States policies toward world population, starting with the USAID. Sander Levin, who had uh, twice run for the governorship of Michigan and lost, but now he was then appointed as assistant administrator for population and humanitarian assistance and immediately took a series of steps to try and force me out of my role as director of the Office of Population. I, I had worked for a dozen other assistant administrators for population and humanitarian assistance, and we never had any trouble. They always were very supportive. Here suddenly comes a person who is determined to just move me away and, and grab a hold of this, even though he had no particular capabilities. Was he a medical doctor? No. Was he a scientist? No. He was a politician. He was a politician. First and for, okay. foremost and everlastingly a politician. <laughs> His brother, Carl Levin, I have a lot of respect for as a... Uh, one of the leading senators, Sandra Levin, was uh, remarkably uh, abrasive. Just get out of me, I want to do this now. He immediately took action to discombobulate and disperse my staff. I had held on hoping that somehow the tide would change, but when I finally realized it would not change, then I decided I wanted to go back with the Centers for Disease Control, where the director was a, a very good friend. We used to work together in Seattle for three years while he was a medical student, Bill, Dr. Dr. Bill Fagey. So I went with him, with the CDC, in their Washington office. My interest has continued, and in this book you'll find some chapters from subsequent years. Mm -hmm. Population in the world continues to go, to go up. Uh, we're, again, as you mentioned earlier, you're at 7.2 billion. We're likely to be 9 billion uh, within the next um, you know, three decades. Well, as I mentioned, the, the task is done in Europe uh, because the European birth rates are down around 10 per thousand. Mm -hmm. That is just about as low as it, I mean, if you keep that, the population will shrink rather than grow. Uh, in other areas, Latin America has come a long ways forward. China has 
really done the, the work. Mm -hmm. uh, India has been a problem all the time. It never really solved its problems, not the way that China did. Mm. India has about 22 births per thousand population, whereas China has one of 12. China's per capita GNP is double what it is in India. All of your work in world population, as you look back now, what, what's your greatest hope uh, in terms of what it's going to take to get world population under control? There's still a lot of work to be done, particularly in Africa. Poor Africa has suffered because uh, by just taking numbers of actions to improve the water, to immunize, they can drop that death rate in an African country in half in just several years. Then, of course, the population grows, but they haven't done anything to improve the, the country otherwise, to handle the additional people. These countries, their populations burgeoned rapidly, and they, they, they had not taken any action to really make life adequate for these burgeoning. As these children that had been saved from, persons saved from death in childhood reached adolescence, so they turned to become either the, both the victims and the doers of wielding machetes and so on to fighting, a lot of fighting in dozens of African countries as a consequence of burgeoning the population without birth control. But in 1994, a, uh, an antagonistic group really mounted a, a remarkable movement with a conference in Cairo, at which time somehow they managed to get a modification of the congressional function where these monies from the U.S. Congress would not just go for birth control, but would go for general health in Africa. Well, very suddenly it changed so that most of this money was being spent to help the increased populations that were coming, and much less to prevent undesired births. And that's where it's been ever since. What has been happening since 1994 is that the uh, U.S. AI, AID monies is now spending more money for pediatrics and helping burgeoning population than it is for sound programs of birth control. Mm -hmm. Dr. Raymond Holt, you've, you've worked all over the world on some of the world's toughest problems. If you had 30 seconds in front of the U.N. General Assembly, what would you tell them to do? And I would simply suggest to them all, just go at it the same way that China did. Get your fertility under control as soon as you can, then you can begin to do many other things to improve your society. Dr. Ravenhold, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much.